Hey everyone, welcome back. If you are watching this video, you have probably seen some way to do maximization before, like this problem you have here in front of you. Uh, you may have done something like maximize on a feasible region by graphing inequalities. Uh, looking at my example here, I've got two products that my factory makes. Uh, they both require a certain number of hours on different machines. I've got my machine one can run for 12 hours a day, machine two can run all day long. Each of my products sells for 100 bucks a piece, and if I sell all the stuff that I make, how much should I be making so that I maximize the amount of revenue that my factory gets? Uh, so the idea, if you're graphing this on a feasible region, what you might have done is you might have you know, assigned that my, the number of product A that I make is called X and the number of product B that I make is called Y. Um, you notice in here that both sell for $100, so if you wanna look at the revenue function that we have, then that would be 100 times x and 100 times y because those are the prices for each of those items. Uh, we have what are called constraints, so those are limiting factors as we look through this. We notice that we are limited by machine one. It can run 12 hours a day, so I know I can use machine one, the amount that I can use it is less than or equal to 12 hours a day. Um, and the way we use machine one is that we need two hours for every product A we make, in other words, two for X, and we need three hours for every product B that we make, in other words, three for Y. So we get the full inequality of two X plus three Y less than equal to 12, and we have a similar thing that goes on with a constraint, a limitation for machine two. It can run 24 hours a day, so we're less than equal 24 in this other one. And what's less than or equal to 24 is the amount of hours that product A and B also both need on machine two. Uh, so we get those, we assume that X and Y are both zero because we're not going to make negative amount of products. And then we begin to graph what's called the feasible region based on our constraints. And so what we maybe have done before is we've graphed one at a time, our two X plus three Y less than equal to 12. We graph that, that is a shaded region below some line here. We've got another graph, six X plus three Y less than equals 24. We have another region that must be satisfied as well. So we look at graphing them together on the set of axes and we notice where do the regions that satisfy each one where they overlap. And we get this region here that you can see and we restrict our attention to that region. In this method of finding the max, what we do is we know that the max is going to occur because these are linear inequalities and because this is a linear revenue function, we know that the maximum is going to occur at one of the vertices, one of the corner points of my graphed feasible region. Uh, so we find all of the corner points, here I've listed them, we plug those corner points, those values for x and y, right, x comma y, into our function that we are trying to maximize for revenue. And we plug that in and we get a bunch of values. And if we're trying to maximize something, then we look for simply the biggest value that we get. And in this case, it's the bottom one. If I plug in three for X and two for Y, in other words, the point three comma two, which is a vertex, then we get 500 and that's the most that we get out of all the vertices. And so we know that our maximum daily revenue is $500. And we would make then three of product A and two of product B every day to maximize our revenue for our factory. This method is great for uh, doing this with just a couple of variables, uh, with just a couple of constraints. The problem becomes what happens when our situation isn't really quite that basic. What if our factory makes more than two products? What if we make three products? Well, I would need another variable. So I had an X axis and a Y axis because I was making two products. We would need three axes if we had a third product. We would also need to graph that in three-dimensional space. Three-dimensional space is great. It's what we walk around in. It's what we brush our teeth in. Graphing on it is really difficult, right? Three-dimensional space comes off the page. The page is only two-dimensional space. Graphing becomes difficult. What if we make a fourth product? Then we need four axes. We'd have to graph in four-dimensional space. What does that even look like? It's really hard to picture. It's hard to imagine what that would be like. If we make 27 products, we would have to graph in 27 dimensional space, and we don't even have enough letters in the alphabet to assign variables to all the products, right? So we need another method that's going to allow us to solve maximization problems when we have more constraints or when we have more products, and we need something that will work without having to graph. And that method is called the simplex method. 
Okay, so getting into maximization with the simplex method, I'm going to point out one small thing that I changed my maximization function to ADX plus 90Y here, otherwise it's the same problem. You'll see why later on in another video why I changed that from 100X 100Y, but it's not important now. So new but very similar problem. We're going to go ahead and show you how to make changes to this so it fits with the simplex method. So the simplex method is designed for if we have maybe lots of variables. So instead of using variables like x and y for our products, with the simplex method we're going to use things like x1 and x2. These are little subscripts. You may have seen these if you did something like slope in algebra. You said like x2 minus x1, right? So this is just saying my first variable that is x and my second variable is x. So these are our products x1 and x2. So in my maximization function then I also need to change it to be 80x1 plus 90x2 instead of 80x plus 90y. And then I'll need to change it in the constraints as well 2x1 plus 3x2 less than equal 12, 6x1 plus 3x2 less than equal 24. We would change our greater than equal zero statements in quadrant one, but if we're maximizing, uh, we're gonna go ahead and assume that everything is a non-negative answer for a variable x1, x2, if you have another one, x3. Um, it's always gonna be assumed, so we are not going to call these a constraint in the simplex method. So if we look at the simplex method, this is what we will have, everything in terms of x1, x2 instead of x and y, and we will no longer have the greater than equal zero statements as part of our subject to list or our constraint list. So setting up the actual simplex table is the rest of what I want to do in this video, and then we'll work on the rest of the simplex method in videos following this in the sequence. So the first thing that we'll do is we need to make the inequalities, our constraints, into equations. And the way we're going to do that is to insert a slack variable into each constraint. And each slack variable we insert into each one is going to be a different one. Okay, So the first one will get a slack variable, the second one will get a slack variable, but they're going to be different slack variables. Um, we're going to turn them into equations. The idea is this is... If I graph this, this is a line, but it's also shading everything below the line. So I could be on the line, but I could also have some slack and be below the line, if that makes sense. Uh, so the idea is um, we're going to actually take out this less than, this inequality, by inserting a variable that we're going to allow to have some slack. Okay, so if we do this, I'm going to call the slack variable that I put in the first inequality to make it an equation, I'll just call it S1 for first slack variable. In the second constraint, I'll just put, I'll call it S2 for second slack variable. So we've done that and we've now considered them to be equations. We will also need to change our maximization equation so that it looks more like our constraints. Our constraints have um, all of our variables on the left side equal to some constant, some number on the right side. This is not that way. Uh, we have a variable on the left side, but we also have variables on the right side. Generally what that means is you want to add or subtract these terms and they will become the opposite sign on the other side of the equation. So if we do that, and we subtract these two terms to the other side, then we'll get our variable terms all on the left side equal to a number. In this case, it's always going to be equal to zero for our maximize equation because we're just moving all of the variables over to the left side. So we end up with this setup, and now we want to set up our table. We're gonna set up the column headers first for the table, and we want to do them in the following order. First thing we want to do is set up our x variables. So you notice in my setup here, I have x1 and x2, so those will be the first things that we have. And then the slack variables, I have an s1 and an s2, so those will be the next thing. And then we have a z, and there's only one z. It's going to be in your maximize equation here. So that is in the next thing. And then everything that it's equal to, a lot of people don't label this as equal to in this last column. I'm just doing it here so you can understand uh, what we have going on here. So the number that it's equal to, uh, those will go in this column. We will go ahead and set up each constraint now in its equation form as a row in our table. If there's anything that's missing as far as column headers, in each equation, we will put a zero in that row. So for example, this first one, I have two x1s, so there's a two there. I have three x2s, so three in the x2 column. I have an s1, so there's one in the s1 column. But you'll notice in this one, I don't have any s2, and I don't have a z in this first equation. So those have zero in those columns for the first row. 
for our second row, we have six X1s, so six goes in that column, three X2s, three goes in the X2 column. I don't have any S1s in the second equation, so a zero goes there, but I do have one S2 in this second equation, no Zs, and then we're equal to 24, so that's our second row of the table so far. We're then going to take the maximization equation that we have, what we're trying to maximize, that we moved everything over equal to zero, and we're going to make that the final row of the table. So if we do the same thing and we plug everything into the table, um, you'll notice we only have x variables and a z variable in this one, right? So as we add that as a last row, we're going to have negative 80, negative 90. I won't have anything for my slacks, so those will both be zero. I have one z here, so I put a one there, and then it's equal to zero so zero goes in the bottom right corner. Once we've put our constraints and then we have put in our maximization equation as our final row, we're going to go ahead and draw lines before the last row and the last column to sort of section those parts of the table off. We're going to use those as sort of guides as we proceed and learn how to do this with the table in the future. And that's our simplex table. So that's as far as we're going to go in this video. In the next video, we're going to tell you how to find a pivot in the table, and then you will learn how to use the pivot later on to reduce your table to get your actual maximum for this problem. All right, we'll see you in the next one.